Okay, so I'm assuming you watched the movie, so you already realized, you know, this is, you know, much like the first, you know, same shit, different toilet, okay? Okay, let's just dig right in. Originally, Rob Zombie didn't want to do another sequel, but he didn't want his vision ruined when the studio insisted that one be made. Dude, if this is your fucking vision, you need laser eye surgery pretty fucking bad, okay? Okay, so, at the hospital we have, you know, the nurses being funny to each other. Okay, can we please be in on the joke? We keep hearing, like, half punchlines and shit. Can the movie please be funny? Then there's the, the stabbing of the nurse. I will admit, it was a pretty decent reveal when she, you know, turns around and we see her having been stabbed. But why did he stab her just once and then let her slowly walk away from there? Why did it take her so long to realize, I've been stabbed in the fucking chest? Why does she not scream or anything? The stabbing of her is pretty effective, and I do like how he, you know, does just one last stab, you know, just making absolutely sure because the 20 or so stabs before that didn't quite do it, you know? And then we find out that that entire fucking opening was a dream. Wait, what? All of it? What about... Michael waking up and, you know, getting out of the, I don't know, car to the morgue, I guess, you know, the one where one of the person, people, there, people, one of the characters, excuses for human beings, are talking about fucking corpses. Did that not happen either? Did Michael not wake up there and get, how the fuck did he recover from the whole head shooting fucking thing. I'm really quite interested in how the fuck they're gonna do a follow-up to this one also. Is the ending gonna be a dream? Is that not gonna have actually been Michael, you know, like, you know, the fucking resurrection twist? You know, is that not gonna have been Lori? Why the fuck did she go insane? What, is it just genetic? She suddenly just saw, you know, the family Myers. Interestingly not enough, not the bigger sister, though. I guess she wasn't part of the family. Maybe she got disowned, you know, post-mortem. Posthumously. I don't know. I really did like the whole her coming apart. You know, we see the drugs have become a crutch for her, you know, and she, she just, she wants more. She just doesn't feel like she can handle the pressure. That was very credible. And, you know, the... Her, her being tired of, you know, the whole annoying self-help thing, you know, one day at a time. You know, I can imagine that that must get really fucking tiring to listen to. As much as it probably is the only fucking way to actually deal with a trauma like that, you know. And the whole thing with Annie, you know, she sees the scars and she feels bad, even though she actually complains about how she knows it's her fault, you know, I don't know, half an hour before she actually finds out that she's his sister. I like her reaction, you know. I'm his sister, and I don't think he's dead. I'm losing my mind. Surely I should go party. Yeah. Yeah, okay. When Weird Al showed up at that interview, I mean, 
his first fucking reply was hilarious, you know, when he started talking about, oh, you know, I don't think I caused that much hurt. I mean, I always ask for permission before I do a parody. That was so funny. That was Weird Al being funny, and that's what Weird Al does. The oh snap thing really wasn't funny. Why didn't we get to see the last of that interview? I mean, here I saw Weird Al. I figured, funny, funny has finally reached this fucking movie. And it lasted all of one joke. I would have loved to see him be torn apart. Loomis torn apart in that interview, you know. Why is it that he thinks that that one interview will, like, end his entire 15 minutes of fame thing? Is that really, you know, is that enough? One bad interview? I mean, if he's been acting anything like we've seen him act all that time, he's been an asshole and a pervert to everyone around him. He actually has the balls to ask one of his fans, I mean, within earshot of other people expecting their books to be signed, are you a natural redhead? You know, he's thinking about, you know, it does the carpet match the drapes, you know? Okay, you know, dude, you're not the fucking penguin, okay? You can't get away with that. With that said, as much of an asshole as Loomis was in this movie, and it was a really big one. I don't quite get how he caused the hostage situation at the end. He caused a lot of pain, and I really liked seeing Brad Riff smack him, but, and I was kind of hoping he would shoot him, I was also hoping that, you know, the other parent was going to shoot. Why the fuck didn't we see Annie's death? I mean, I get that, you know, not showing things sometimes, but she was a big character, and it's not like this movie shied away from showing a lot of death scenes. Anyway, I don't see how exactly Loomis caused the hostage negotiation. I mean, Michael knew that she was his sister, you know, because he has sibling radar or some shit. I don't know. He knew in the first fucking movie, it seemed. How exactly does the book... I don't know, because it made her go party? I mean, she was the only one who read the book and found something out. I mean, don't get me wrong. I appreciate the image of, you know, Myers sitting there you know, with the page-turner that I'm sure it must have been in hand. What the fuck?! You know, but it ain't like that. We know it's not like that. So, how exactly is the whole thing with the hostage negotiation Loomis' fault? The ending... Love hurts. Really, Rob? Really? You were fucking pushing it in the first one. You know that, right? This... I mean, I was warned. I knew. I've known for maybe a year that that was going to happen. And still, when that ending came, I cracked up. It, it was the most fucking hilarious thing I've seen in a horror movie for a long fucking time. I gotta take a moment. Early on, when the sheriff is, you know, saying, I don't want any surprises until morning. What, you don't mind surprises as long as they're not tonight? Is that it? And then he says, Nothing that happened here tonight is obvious. Are you seriously saying that not every single fucking thing that happened in the first movie was extremely obvious and you could see it a mile away? And then, you know, a little after that we meet Buddy and he's a very likable character. And then he dies. Two minutes after, if that. 
when she's yelling, oh, buddy, no, you could literally cut to a shot of, like, a dog dying, you know, under whatever circumstance, and it would make a lot more sense. Oh, buddy, who the fuck is called Buddy? That's a dog name. I would say that her altruism as Laurie runs away from the hospital through the rain. I mean, here she is in mortal danger. And yet, all she can think about is everyone else. I mean, she keeps yelling, help somebody, help somebody. That That's just, she's a true example to all of us. Let's skip ahead to, you know, after Annie has been killed, the sheriff sitting there, he looks like he's fucking sulking. He looks like a five-year-old who's just been denied candy or something. Love his reaction to her having died, by the way. Worst moment of acting in the entire fucking film. And that's Brad DeRiff. I gotta say, Danielle Harris has got some serious fucking invulnerability in this franchise. This is the fourth time she's appeared, and the first time she's died. I know I'm jumping back and forth a lot here, but, you know, I don't know. I must look like I have the attention span of Rob Zombie or something. Anyway, when she's talking to the psychologist, don't you just love how the bitch actually says they never found his body. Oh, thank you very fucking much, Miss Psychotherapist. That is so fucking helpful. I realized that it was delivery of exposition, and it was sloppy as hell. Why even have it? It's said to Loomis, you know, five fucking minutes later. I think something just, something inside me just snaps. I think it might be my spine. Can you recommend a good chiropractor? Why is Michael running around unmasked? At the end, when he unmasks, he looks like a fucking hobo. There's nothing scary about him with that huge fucking beard. Tyler Maine actually does look fairly fucking intimidating. Have you watched X-Men? But give him a beard like that, and he just looks ridiculous. Well, I was very nearly a victim myself, which you can read all about in my book. You know, near the end, Wolfman nearly got laid there. Killed by his own bladder. Fuck, that sucks. Some of these lines don't even make sense if you don't read them as, you know, the meaning they're supposed to you know, when Loomis says, freaks always find their way home, okay, that works as in, you know, telling us that Michael Myers is going to return to Hattonfield and, you know, attack Laurie, but why the fuck else would he even say it in that interview there? That makes no fucking sense. Also, a little earlier... He actually spells after saying, do you need me to spell it out for you? Who does that? It's a rhetorical question. So that Frankenstein dude actually was saying perverted stuff to the kids? I mean, we didn't hear anything in the scene. I thought Laurie was just imagining it, but then later we find out that he is a pervert. That was kind of not very smart arranging there, Rob. Why are they referring to Michael as the most notorious serial killer? I mean, he didn't kill that many. His kills weren't that creative. He's the most recent, maybe, but really the most notorious? 